Okay, welcome back to class. I uh, hope you had a good weekend. We're going to return to the open access problem that we had looked at on Friday. The, 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 that compensation problem of what, what existing fishermen would be willing to pay in order to keep out new entrants, or alternatively, what new entrants would be willing to pay to enter. Um, that, that way of thinking about it gives uh, give some insight into what we're trying to do ultimately, which is to, to find uh, a, an amount of fishing effort that maximizes the total value of the fishery. And if you can, if you can have those two parties, you know, the new entrants and the existing boats, if you can have them come up with a agreeable bargain as to whether they should be allowed to enter or not, um, if property rights, rights are well-defined and, and, um, there's an ability to exclude, but also ability to negotiate. That negotiation will lead to the optimal number of, of boats, just in the same way as the, the farmer and the rancher will come up with a, um, an optimal arrangement of, of a herd size, which balances the benefits of, of an additional steer against the losses associated with, with having that extra steer in terms of crops destroyed. So it's it's that, that way of looking at the problem that we did last Friday is, uh, just a way of showing how uh, there is a point at which the, the the profit in the fishery is maximized, and after you continue to add boats after that, you actually reduce total profits. So that's just another way of looking at the problem. Um, and so we'll 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 look at that um, just a little bit more today, and then get into some issues of intertemporal um, intertemporal resource use and optimal optimal intertemporal allocation of of resources. So the, the rule that we found, uh, that we talked about this last Wednesday, I think, but the rule that we found, which was confirmed, and this, we, we actually, used, in, in a sense, we derived this rule on our own, looking at in-class problem three, looking at the incentives of existing uh, boats relative to potential um, new entrants into the fishery. The, the rule that we found was that it's, it makes sense economically to, at, keep adding boats to the fishery as long as marginal benefit equals marginal, uh, sorry, as long as marginal benefit is greater than marginal cost, it makes sense to continue to add boats. You can, you can increase the total output and value of the fishery by continuing to add boats until marginal benefit equals marginal costs. As soon as marginal benefit equals marginal costs, and then as, as soon as it starts to dip below marginal cost, as soon as marginal benefit falls below marginal cost, it no longer makes sense to throw resources at, at the fishery or the open access resource. You're just, you're, you're, you're spending more, more resources than you're actually getting back overall um, as, as a whole, like as the, the, that's true for the fishery as a whole, even though it might not be true for individual boats. Uh, so that's, as long as, again, this, this would be the case where as long as new entrants would be willing to pay more than the profit that's lost to existing uh, boats, as long as those new entrants would be willing to pay more than, than the profit lost, then it makes sense to keep adding boats. But as long as, once you get to the point where new boats wouldn't be able to, to pay and compensate the existing boats for their, for their lost profits, then it makes sense to actually stop and, and, and limit the size of the, of the number of boats in the fishery. Right. So this is, um, that's the, the marginal benefit equals marginal cost principle, which, which dictates the efficient point. We saw that, that boats are going to still want to enter uh, until average revenue is equal to marginal cost because they're, they're still able to cover their marginal costs privately um, as, long as, as long as average revenue is, is greater than marginal cost. So they can still make money they can still cover their, their opportunity costs of their time. They can still cover their, their fuel costs and maintenance costs. They can still cover those costs and, and make a little bit of profit up until the point where average revenue is equal to marginal cost. But that's, that's the point where we have way more, way more fishing than, um, than we would like. Way more fishing than would be optimal if we could somehow limit the number of, of boats. Some examples of the way that this could be solved um, is by 
by you know either creating property rights as we as we saw kind of in the in, in class problem three of of if we we imagined what would happen if existing boats had property rights over the rights of fish and they then and new entrants had to had to compensate them in order to to um in a sense rent you know the the right to fish from them uh that's one way of kind of getting at this this optimal outcome um what it really comes down to ultimately is the fact that the fish <clears throat> the fish are are not priced in in a case where anyone is 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 allowed to enter the fishery the fish themselves are not they have basically a price of zero there's no there's no limit on the amount of fish and anyone can enter the fishery and 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 come in and and take whatever they can that's that's the that's the the key part where the incentives break down. The fact that the fish are given away for free means that you're going to have an excessive amount of fishing. Even but but even if you have one company that owns the fishery themselves, in that case they have an incentive. In in that case they sort of own the fish and they have an incentive to to use the fish and harvest them in a way that that maximizes the value. Um, whereas if it's open access new entrants come in and and just capture those extra profits and 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 reduce the profits of the existing boats because because the the fish themselves are not priced the fish themselves are not subject to any sort of restriction there's there's a famous paper from 1968 that that talks about the the tragedy of the commons and there's an interesting line in the paper where he talks about this is Garrett Hardin talking about there's no technical solution to the problem it's not like technology is lacking to solve this problem. It's not as if building different sorts of mechanisms, like physical mechanisms or different kinds of boats or different kinds of fishing technology is going to solve it. It's not as, it's not the same as like putting a man on the moon, for example, like that's, that's an engineering problem. That's a technical problem where we can just, if we understand the physics and the mechanics of how, how planets orbit and we understand how, how thrust works, we can, we can get ourselves to the moon by technical knowledge. In, that, in this case, in, in a tragedy of the common situation, it's not a lack of technical knowledge. There's no, there's no technical way to solve this problem. It's, it's a social problem. And so what, what, what needs to happen is incentives need to change in some way. And so this is, this is the key to the, this tragedy of the commons problem is, is there needs to be some kind of change in incentives or change in institutions, which will, uh, guide guide individuals to act in a way that will will maximize the value of a resource relative to um, the way they would naturally act which would just be to 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 overfish so again this is this is kind of a simple this is a very simple stylized kind of solution and if you read the uh, the eleanor ostrom paper eleanor ostrom is a um, a political scientist who did decades of field work um, all across the world, looking at how how communities and governments and and individuals have tried to solve open access problems, and, and if you read that paper, um, we, one of the one of the big points that she tries to emphasize over and over again is that there's not a one size fits all solution to these kinds of commons problems. Even if even if one kind of policy works in one scenario, um, it's not guaranteed to work in another scenario there's going to be different kinds of social dynamics in some communities which make certain policies fail in 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 those communities even though they work in a different community there's not a single solution that will work everywhere and to imagine that there's um to imagine that there's one there's one policy that can apply universally to these kinds of common property resource problems is um is to believe in fairy tales uh, nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, all that said, it's it's important to to consider conceptually how incentives could change under different kinds of policies or different arrangements. And so this this next part here, I'm gonna I'm gonna show is one one possibility, at least at a theoretical level, for how to how to change incentives so that individual boats have have a reason privately have, they privately have a reason to act in a way that will maximize the value of the fishery. So one of those ideas or one of those potential mechanisms is this idea of a license fee. All right, so the problem we had before was that the fish were given away for free. There was no restriction. Even though existing boats could compensate and would perhaps want to compensate 
existing boats um, and compensate them for maybe not entering the fishery or, or somehow restrict them. There was no mechanism for doing that. This license fee sort of represents one mechanism for restricting entry into the fishery. So this graph is from the, the textbook, and this is a useful graph for kind of summarizing what the incentives are under different arrangements. And uh, we show here average revenue, which is this, this, black, this black line on top. That's AR, that's, that's decreasing at a particular rate. It's actually a, a, a flatter curve. It's a flatter curve than the marginal revenue curve. So the marginal revenue curve is given by this gray, this gray line, which slopes down at a steeper rate. You can show mathematically why that's true. I don't, I don't have time to, to fully show exactly why average revenue is, is a flatter curve, but you can, you can look at that, um, at that mathematically. And if, if you want to know more about that, you can come to office hours and I can explain exactly why, why that average revenue curve is a flatter, has a flatter slope than the marginal revenue curve. But the, the important point is that, and we saw this before, but that the, the open access equilibrium, the point at which um, individual boats will want to continue entering the fishery is, is where average revenue is equal to marginal cost. That's where there's still profit to be made. There's still profit to be made as long as average revenue is higher than marginal cost. So to have entry into the fishery until the point at which average revenue is equal to marginal cost. But as we said before, what we would prefer it to have is fishing at, a, at the level where, where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. Okay, so one way that we can, we can sort of replicate this, this MR equals MC condition, even if, even if we can't restrict entry directly or we can't, we can't directly change um, people's behavior, one way we can, we can do this is by um, charging a license fee, which is equal to, basically equal to the gap equal to the gap between average revenue and marginal cost at the optimal number of boats. So this, if you think about this, this vertical distance, if we make that the license fee and we, and we charge boats that extra cost, if they want to enter the fishery, they have to pay that license fee. We're artificially raising their costs and therefore kind of artificially making it more expensive for them to fish that will naturally restrict entry and it will actually make people not want to continue to enter the fishery beyond the point at which um, at which we have the optimal number of boats. I'm going to call the optimal number of boats uh, N star. That's somewhere between six and 700 boats. Um, but if we put that license fee on, if we slap that license fee on and we now have this, this in a sense, it's a vertical shift in the uh, the cost curve or the supply curve, just like we had with the Pagovian tax. Then, remember, individual boats are still going to want to enter until the average revenue is equal to their marginal costs. Except now, their marginal costs include not just their private costs, but also the license fee. And we have we have a situation where now that incentive will be for boats to stop entering once once we get to the point where the marginal cost plus the license fee is equal to marginal revenue. And that if we set that license fee at that correct level, basically at the at the vertical distance between average revenue and marginal cost at, at the number of boats, uh, that will be the, the, the fee that would in theory be able to restrict entry and make it privately optimal for boats to stop entering once we reach the N star amount. Okay, so that's that's kind of one that's one policy um, one policy recommendation or one policy option, which would which would sort of correct that correct that market failure, correct the the overfishing, correct the um, the continued entry of boats even after it's no longer profitable to have them enter. So this, the the idea of this of this license fee is that. We charge a license fee that's high enough so that the 650th boat, let's say, let's say the number of, of optimal boats is, is 650. It's, it's somewhere between 600 and 700 based on that graph. Let's say this, this number of optimal boats is 650. You want to charge the license fee so that the 650th boat 
is profitable, but the 651st boat no longer is profitable privately. Um, in, our, in, our, in our case, the, the numbers that would, that would allow us to do that would be a, a $4,600 license fee would be high enough to, to make that happen uh, based on the kind of the stylized example with the numbers that we have. But in general, in general, it's, it's charging the difference between average revenue and marginal cost at, at the optimal number of boats N star. So the, let me just, if I can just summarize kind of the, the, the results of, of that of that idea, we have, you know, license fee, the optimal license fee, or the license fee that will, that will help us replicate the, the socially optimal level of fishing is, is going to be average revenue at N star minus marginal cost at N star. In principle, that's, the, that's the level of, of that's the, the, the level of the license fee that will lead to the socially optimal amount of, of fishing. Um, that's the amount that will make profit uh, profit zero or negative for any for any boats that try to enter um, after the 650 boats or the or the n star number of boats. Um, so that's graphically that's that's just this distance. That's this distance um, between uh, again average revenue at the optimal number of boats, that red dot, and then the marginal cost. Um, at the optimal number of boats, the, the, the red dot below that, that's the, theoretically, that's the, that's the size of the license fee that would um, lead to people's natural incentives to, to stop, uh, to stop fishing once, once you get to, to that number of boats. Okay. And again, that's because, that's because the, the private incentives are always for or the open access, the open access incentives are, are to fish until average revenue equals marginal cost. But we would prefer that they would fish only until marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And so this license fee kind of kind of transforms, it sort of tra artificially transforms this into this. That's kind of the idea of of the license fee. Is it 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 makes it makes the the previous private con, private uh, profit maximizing conditions. It sort of transforms the private profit maximizing conditions. It transforms them into the socially optimal uh, value maximizing conditions. So that's in theory what's going on with the with the license fee. Um, and equivalently, equivalently, what you could do is, and we kind of showed this a little bit within class problem three, is if you just simply gave the rights or or had someone pay for the rights to fish, like to own the fishery or own a, a share of the fishery themselves, if there was like quotas or some kind of, um, you know, some kind of right, some property right, which, you know, some, some, some deed or some piece of paper that gave you legal authority to be able to fish a certain amount per year, either because you were the owner of the fishery or because you purchased a, a small share from the owner. If you had a system like that, that would also be um, something that could limit the number of fish. And that's, that's something called an indiv individual transferable quota system, which would have the same effect of making people pay for the fish that they're, that they're taking out. And they have to account for the fact that if they come in and fish, they're reducing the, the, the profits available for others. And if you were to say auction those off or auction off quotas, or have them issue quotas initially and have them be able to be traded among the fishers. Uh, in that case, you could also lead to, a, um, in theory, you could also lead to a, a, good, a good outcome or a value maximizing outcome for, for the fishery as a whole. That, I wanted to go through that, that, that theoretical problem of how to, um, how to in theory, correct for, for um, the, the perverse incentives that prevail under open access. Um, I just wanted to, to mention, there's a couple other, um, you know, non non governmental or non non top down approaches to, or or, or non coercive approaches to solving these kind of collective action problems. It's not always the case, as as you saw in the Eleanor Ostrom article. It's not always the case that that um, uh, individuals can't can't come together and act collectively in a way that that makes sense. 
um, examples of, of or counterexamples of that or counterexamples of, of where this fails uh, happen all the time in real life where people are actually able to to get together and make make contributions to the public good or come up with contractual arrangements voluntarily which which solve this problem so what you know one one common example of this in everyday life is that um, you know I think it's once or twice a year National Public Radio will have pledge drive week where they they talk about oh we, you know we have all this great programming which you value so highly you know consider we we just heard that great story from from this reporter wow wasn't that a great story now you, you know we need money to to kind of make this happen why don't you consider you know giving us you know five dollars or ten dollars a month we'll send you a mug or a tote bag and you'll have a warm glow for for contributing money to this great programming and supporting this great programming that you love so dearly that kind of stuff is is what they do you know they do that a couple times a year and you know people listen to that and they and they feel you know compelled to to give or at least you know some people do at least enough where they can sustain uh still having um npr be a, a thing so those those are ways that you know even if you don't give you can still tune into npr um but but uh enough people do it enough people feel you know a kind of a social obligation or they feel um you know, they, they feel that it, 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 it's valuable enough to them that they want to support it. You know, there's enough, there's enough people out there to do that, that, that even though you could get by without paying people, people do, do pay. Right. So that's, that's a way that, that some of these, um, these collective action problems can, can get solved. There's uh, another example of this is a really interesting case of uh, the relationship between beekeepers and and apple growers. This is this is prominent in kind of the uh, the northwest part of the United States, in, in especially in Washington State, where they grow a lot of apples. Um, apple growers require um, require the the presence of bees in order to pollinate their their trees and, and allow them to to um, produce apples. You know those those trees need pollinators, and one problem is that if if one apple orchard owner comes in and um, purchases a beehive or a couple beehives or purchases maybe rents beekeeping beekeeping services maybe they 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 pay for a beekeeper to come in for part of the year and put their hives in and then and then uh, and then leave after kind of the the pollinating season is over if one if one f uh, apple orchard owner or one you know one one apple grower decides to to purchase those beekeeping services and there's a neighboring orchard right next door there's no way for for the neighboring owner not to get some of that beekeeping services too or not not to get some of those pollinating services as well the bees don't know which trees have been you know which trees belong to the owner which pay for the beekeeping services versus which trees are are in the in the property of the owner that didn't pay for the services, the bees are just going to go and 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 pollinate whatever is in front of them, and maybe that means some of them spill over to the neighboring orchards, which which uh, the farmers didn't pay for, that who didn't pay for the beekeeping services. So you have this 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 dilemma where where as a private apple orchard owner, you'd prefer to just maybe sit back and wait until your neighbor gets gets a, a beehive and then you know benefit from some of the bees that will will sort of naturally drift onto your land and pollinate your trees that's kind of a dilemma in the same way that this fishing problem is a dilemma you have this uh, this this desire to free ride natural incentives to free ride and so you might think that's that's intractable but um but there's there's been this this kind of informal custom that's developed among these these orchard owners kind of it has emerged naturally over time as they as they sort of have had to resolve this collective action problem but the um the rule that's emerged the kind of the informal rule that's emerged is that everybody just has sort of agreed that they're going to keep the same number of beehives and it's kind of it, it would it, it's kind of socially ex uh you know, there's some social pressure to to maintain like you know if, if everyone will kind of get together at the beginning of the year and say okay we're going to each keep two beehives you know that's that's going to be enough for producing this year or maybe we expect weather to be particularly good and we expect there to be uh, 
more output this year, so we're going to we're going to need to up that to three in order to pollinate the, the total number. Um, they kind of they kind of get together and they agree on a, a, a fixed number that each of them will keep. So each of them keeps three beehives. So some of the bees that that come from one person's land will go on to the other person's land. Um, some of the bees that that originate from the second person's land will drift onto the first person's land, and the the externalities kind of cancel out, where you don't have anybody like being able to completely free ride off the off the behavior of someone else. And so that's that's just an example of a, a informal arrangement um, which has sort of emerged over time because because there's this this potential of free riding, people have come up with ways of resolving that problem. And the custom of the orchard is one one sort of social arrangement that that um, these apple orchard owners have have uh, devised over time in in Washington State in order to try to resolve that that problem. Okay, that's another example of of kind of a, a not not a top down solution to to a collective action problem. Um, and then there's there's also this you know I mentioned Eleanor Alstrom she's gone around the world and and looked at all kinds of different. Uh, ways that, that communities themselves have, have found which, which resolve a collective action problems. I, I was at Purdue University. I went to, to school there um, for my master's and I, I actually went to see Eleanor Ostrom speak uh, at Purdue. She came and gave a, a lecture on, on this topic of, of collective action and resolving tragedy of the commons issues. And she told a story uh, about um, a community in Nepal that um, they were they were trying to, to build um, like an irrigation ditch. They were trying to to, to build a, a ditch that would divert some some river water away from the river into their agricultural area in order to um, enhance agricultural productivity and give themselves um, opportunities to 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 irrigate and have you know be able to grow crops that were independent of of, of rainfall. And they had to exert a significant amount of effort to dig this ditch and and create this this um, this piece of water infrastructure, and so it required an effort on the part of all members of the community. And one of the ways that they enforced um, one of the ways that they enforced contrib like contributing to the 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 building of this of this irrigation ditch was um, if you know if somebody was not contributing or not putting forth effort. In order to um, help build this this water infrastructure, um, if you know if it was sort of agreed upon that 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 this person was was kind of not pulling their weight, um, they would they would take one of their cows and and put him in a cow jail. So they would there would be like a a fenced in area in the middle of the village where they would take one of the cows and um, they would put him in that in that fenced in area, and everybody knew whose cow that was. Everybody everybody knew. Who, whose cow belonged to whom, and they would they would put their cow in the middle of this uh, of the community, in this fence, and it would be kind of like a, a way of shaming that person and kind of uh, letting the community know that this person was not was not uh, pulling their weight with regard to this this community project that was going on, and it was just a simple a simple mechanism that was very effective for. Um, getting people to cooperate because you didn't want your cow to end up in the cow jail, um, and so you sort of had an incentive to 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 make sure you were contributing at at a level that that was um, uh, expected for for the community um, to be able to build this ditch. And so th that was just one kind of informal mechanism for for the way that um, uh, this particular community in Nepal was able to. Resolve this problem because you know if if once the ditch is built, um, you get to benefit from it just like everybody else, and so your natural incentive would be to try to do as little as possible. But this this uh, this cow jail mechanism was one one kind of economic policy that that the community had had devised themselves to solve that problem. Okay, so that's this this is all to say that there's various ways of 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 dealing with with these collective action issues it's not it's not just that there there needs to be taxes or subsidies or some sort of regulation from the government there, there's also ways of dealing with these that have nothing to do with with um top down with top down policy but they come from sort of bottom up community led 
uh, community-led activities. All right, so the next, the next topic then is uh, intertemporal resource use. And this is one of my favorite, this is one of my favorite topics in all of economics. This, this has to do with how, how to use something that's gonna run out, how to use it as best you can over time. Uh, we can't, we, we just, it's not reasonable to expect something that can't last forever to last forever. If, if something is, is finite and exhaustible, um, we can't just snap our fingers and have it last forever by magic. Um, so we have to deal with the fact that it's not, it's not going to last forever. If it, if it is exhaustible, if it's going to run out, uh, we have to somehow deal with that. And so we're living under those, under those physical constraints of limited resources, which could, could potentially be exhausted. Um, we have to, we just have to live with that. That's, that's, that's a, a fact of the universe. That's a physical fact. But, but there are ways that we can use it over time, which, which are, which allow us to get more benefits out of it than, than other ways. Fundamentally, what it comes down to is this idea of user costs. Oops. User costs, which is, is a very, very subtle and tricky idea, which I don't think I actually understood until I got to graduate school. Um, I, I, took, I took it undergrad environmental economics um, at Wisconsin. I went to University of Wisconsin and I took um, environmental economics with Professor David Lewis. And this was part of, this was part of that course. And I, I think I just, you know, I, I, I kind of, I heard what he was saying. I, I, I read the book, but I don't think it actually sunk in what these things actually are, what these user costs are. And I'm going to try to do my best to um, clearly explain what they are. Um, and, and with the understanding that it's very tricky and subtle and difficult. So let's, let's just, let's, I'm going to do my best to just take this a piece at a time and explain uh, what what user costs are so uh, at, at a basic level it's just another kind of externality a user cost is just another kind of externality anytime you use a part of a finite resource today and you use part of it up that's those are units which are not going to be available to you in the future so the user costs are essentially the the foregone opportunities in the future that you don't get because you use more of a resource right now okay that's that's definitionally that's what it is uh, but i think some examples is going are going to help to to make that that point a little bit clearer because it's it's kind of a tricky concept what you need what you need in order for user costs to exist are two things and, they, and these are really the only the only two things you need for user costs to exist you need some kind of diminishing marginal benefits within a given period. The second thing you need is you just have to have something that's in limited supply, something that's in fixed supply that's exhaustible. I guess, I, I guess there's, there's, also, there's also one more thing you need, which is just multiple periods. Um, that's kind of implied by the fact that this is, a, this is an intertemporal resource issue, but you, you, do need, you also need multiple periods um, to, uh, to have user costs in the first place. So let's let's look at a, at a, at a at a simple example where this is true. You have a, a fixed supply of a resource. You have two periods. We're gonna have Q1 denote the first period quantity. We're gonna have Q2 denote the second period quantity. Um, this fixed this fixed supply is gonna be given by this equation here, where the total amount that you consume in in period one and period two has to be equal to 250. Marginal benefits of using this uh, this resource are are given by this this fun, this uh, equation here. Marginal benefits equal 150 minus 0.25 Q. We have marginal costs, which are given by this equation. This this is kind of just like you saw in homework two. We have a marginal benefit curve, marginal cost curve. Um, marginal benefits are decreasing with Q. Marginal costs are increasing with Q. The combination of these marginal benefits and marginal cost gives us a, a demand and supply curve. Notice that the, the supply curve 
the supply curve just accounts for, at least for right now, the supply curve just accounts for the extraction cost of this resource. It doesn't account for the inherent scarcity of the resource or the user cost yet. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll show how you might um, incorporate that into the into the uh, the analysis later, but for right now, it's just describing extraction costs. All right. So if if we can um, we can take this this the you know remember the supply curve gives gives costs. So you know the area under this supply curve is the total costs of providing that amount. Remember the um, the Demand curve gives benefits, so the, you know the area below the demand curve gives benefits, or the total benefits associated with consuming a certain amount. The area between represents sort of the the surplus or the net benefits of consuming the resource. So, kind of from a, from a social point of view, from the point of view of society, um, what we really care about is this area in between the the, the benefits. The marginal benefits and the marginal cost. That's going to be sort of the net benefits that we get as a society for consuming this resource. So we can take we can take the uh, the, the marginal benefit curve. If we take that 150 minus 0 0.25, and we subtract the marginal costs, which were 50 50 minus 0. 25, or I guess uh, plus 0 0.25 Q. If we subtract those, we get we get a net benefit function. We can get we can get net benefits. Um, in this case, the marginal net benefits after we take that difference is 100 minus 0.5 Q. That just comes from subtracting subtracting marginal costs from marginal benefits. Okay, so uh, just one thing we can do, one kind of simplification we can make, we can transform marginal benefits and marginal costs into marginal net benefits, uh, produce a curve that looks like this. And this is actually gonna make, um, make it a little bit easier to understand if we just think of it from the point of view of marginal net benefits to society. Um, and we, if we analyze that, that can that can um, uh, just make just make it a little easier to, to to grasp this idea of user costs, which we'll talk about next. Uh, so I have I have these slides.